Dr. Ron Allen is our senior professor of Bible exposition. He earned a diploma at the California Lutheran Bible School and a Bachelor of Arts from California State University in Los Angeles. Did a THM as well as a THD uh, before we changed it to a PhD uh, here at Dallas Theological Seminary. And in addition to uh, his teaching responsibilities, he's been very involved as a guest professor and lecturer in a number of North American and overseas schools. He preaches across the country. He leads tours to Israel, Turkey, and Greece. He's been a theological consultant for Maranatha Music. He's written a number of books and was the senior editor of the New King James Version Study Bible and the Nelson Study Bible and the Nelson Illustrated Bible Commentary. Apart from his academic pursuits, he loves music. He loves riding his bicycle. And he just recently uh, raced and uh, rode again uh, in the hotter than Hades <laughs> race out in Wichita Falls. Dr. Allen and his wife Beverly have four grown children and 10 grandchildren. Uh, Dr. Allen, uh, welcome to the platform again. Would you welcome Dr. Ron Allen to our focus? <laughs> You'd think the president of Dallas Seminary would not have trouble saying the word hell. <laughs> well, just saying. I am uh, so thrilled to be here with you. It's, uh, it's an honor beyond honor to be uh, asked to speak at uh, chapel in Dallas Seminary. And uh, however, this week is Heritage Week, and you know you're really old when they ask you to speak at uh, <laughs> Heritage Week. Let's see, are we going to get the pictures on the screen? Uh, they're working on Oh, good. So I'm going to speak to you about something that uh, you're well aware of if you have had your eyes open as you've wandered through the campus these last few days. This is the beginning of the 90th year of uh, the ministry of God at Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, what, a, what a marvelous thing to think about. There are lots and lots of schools who have long histories, but a few schools may, remain true uh, to their origins over decades. And by God's grace, uh, we believe this is true of our school, and we're just so thrilled about it. So everywhere you go uh, on campus, you're going to see banners. And uh, let's see, this is not advancing. This is supposed to be advancing. Uh, you're, uh, we have banners everywhere. Do I have to raise it up high? I don't know. It's stuck. Um, uh, we not only have banners, we have floor mats. Uh, we have the numbers 90 that you can take pictures beside. And uh, we even have billboards. I have all these pictures. Uh, <laughs> on I-30. Did you know that? Yeah, here come the banners. Um, maybe. There they come. I knew they were there. And uh, homiletics professors, look at my new gesture. <laughs> and here, did you see this on I-30? A billboard celebrating uh, the 90th anniversary of our school. I mean, this is a really, really big deal. And while I'm talking about this, the president is thinking, well, that's nothing compared to 10 years from now, uh, toward which plans are being made. Um, and um, uh, we're celebrating in, in advance. The uh, celebrative issue of Kindred Spirit uh, has uh, uh, 90 on it as well. Well, in addition to uh, 90 years of Dallas Seminary, um, this is a year where numbers are really important in my life. Um, yeah, this past weekend, uh, uh, Dr. Bailey said, um, I was in Wichita Falls, this is the 19th year in a row I've been in Wichita Falls for that uh, bicycling weekend. And for 19 years in a row, on the same weekend, I preached at Grace Church, a church that uh, is pastored by uh, Dallas Seminary graduates and uh, has had, um, this church has had remarkable blessing from God. Dr. Tom Rogers and uh, Pastor Reggie Cole have become very dear friends. So uh, this is also the beginning of my 20th year teaching here at Dallas Seminary. Uh, but uh, the big number for me 
is the number 50. Because it was 50 years and two weeks ago that my wife Beverly and I first came to Dallas Seminary for me to begin classes here. So some of you have stood, and you're brand new, and uh, I was brand new once as well. <laughs> <laughs> but it was 50 years ago. I can hardly believe that. Uh, we left from Monterey Park, California, uh, where I, uh, we lived when, we were in, when I was in college. And we got a U-Haul and filled it with all our worldly possessions. And uh, the plan was uh, we would ride in the cab of the U-Haul and tow our car. Uh, but what happened is I did a test ride around the block and the add-on uh, tow bar snapped off uh, in the first block. So I called my sister Peggy and she agreed to, to drive with my wife Beverly and our one-year-old baby girl in the car and I would drive the U-Haul. And so we set across country deciding to drive at night. Uh, it's not only hot in Dallas, it's hot in Arizona in August and uh, the Mojave Desert. So we drove at night. And I remember one night in West Texas, it was three in the morning, and uh, I was driving this U-Haul, uh, a 55 mile an hour governor on it. And so Bev didn't drive with me. She says, that's too slow. <laughs> <laughs> So she'd leave two hours later from wherever we stayed, and, and my, my vision was going. And, oh no, I'm coming to Dallas Seminary. I, I'm going to need eyes, Lord. <laughs> and gradually, over a couple of hours, I, I, was, I was having a harder and harder time seeing anything. And then finally, I was in pitch dark, and I realized it wasn't my eyes but the generator was gone in the truck <laughs> and the headlamps were off. <laughs> so I drove in the dark to a garage and he, he uh, put a charge on my battery and um, then I stood on the road to see if I could find my car that Beverly's driving. My 60s Studebaker Dodge Lark. Oh, oh, what? I wrote the wrong name. Oh, that's terrible. It says 60 Studebaker Lark. Uh, that's really dumb. 60, <laughs> 60 Studebaker Lark. And um, so Bev uh, and I, we decided we have to drive in the day, the last day. My sister fell asleep at the wheel, drove into a field, picked up a rock, it, uh, went through the radiator, messed up the, uh, the fan. And we spent much of a day in Baird, Texas, east of Abilene, as the car was being repaired and the truck was being charged. And finally, finally we made it to Dallas. It was 9.30 at night. And I knew it had been hot during the day. This is long before air conditioning was common in cars. But it was 9.30, and I'm from Southern California. And no matter how hot it is during the day, it always cools off at night. We got out of the car at Live Oak at the Travel Lodge, a hotel that uh, Dr. Bailey uh, later called when it was under poor management, Roach Hotel. <laughs> We've since demolished that and we have a parking lot there. But um, back in those days, that was a respectable place. But I got out of the car <laughs> and it was 180 degrees outside or something. Well, you know, you just got here yourself, some of you. And I couldn't believe it. But the next morning, we got up and we came across. You couldn't see the seminary from Live Oak in those days. We crossed over on Apple, and then we saw it. Dallas Theological Seminary. The buildings that you see today that were there then are all in Armageddon zone. Uh, those are the three buildings of the Quad uh, that was never finished, Stearns Hall and uh, uh, the Armstrong Hall and Mosier only library and the chapel. But those were the buildings and they were made of gold and the leaded windows were studded with diamonds <laughs> and all the fixtures were solid silver. We were at Dallas Theological Seminary. 
And I was so excited I couldn't believe it. I still have the catalog from that first year. And I've gone over the list of my fellow classmates last night in prayer as I looked at them. There were 84 of us, and at that time the student body numbered 331, and tuition, hold on to your Birkenstocks, was $10 an hour. And, and we had professors that were just outstanding. Uh, we had a stellar roster. Um, in theology, Dr. Walvoord, the president, and Charles Ryrie. In Old Testament, Merrill Unger, and the young man who became so influential in my life, um, Bruce Waltke. In preaching, Haddon Robinson. In New Testament, uh, Zane Hodges, S. Lewis Johnson, and Dr. Toussaint, who's going to be speaking on Friday. He's another one of those young guys, and he's going to be here on Friday. Um, in uh, missions, uh, George Peters in theology. In, um, uh, let's see, what am I going to miss now? Uh, we had just outstanding, uh, George Dollar was the history professor. Uh, J. Elwood Evans taught pastoral theology and was the dean. Uh, John Whitmer was the librarian. I remember them all. And I remember classes from them and how wonderful it was to be here. But you know, the thing that um, impressed me the most was what I learned about the character of God from my professor, Dr. Walkie. There's a passage I'd like you to turn to in the Bible. It's Exodus 34, verses 5 and 6. Yesterday, Dr. Mark Bailey took us to the Holy of Holies of the book of Isaiah. Um, in Isaiah 6, and he emphasized uh, that God is high and lofty, and that God is holy beyond the capacity of human language to describe. And he ended by talking about his grace. And what I want to focus on as a follow-up to that message, I see these in tandem, is the grace of God that is shown um, to Moses in what I regard to be the single most important passage of the self-revelation of God, Exodus 34, verses 5 and 6. This is where Moses was hidden in the cleft of the rock. Chapter 32 is where the saved community committed horrible sin by worshiping at the golden calf. Chapter 33, Moses, separated from the congregation, had visitations from God that from a distance looked as though there were a pillar of a cloud. There was a pillar of a cloud, but up close, only Moses was close. He saw fingers and, and uh, hands and toes and feet and face, and he talked to the Lord as one would talk to a friend. And, but from a distance, it looked like a shimmery, uh, ethereal, standing pillar cloud. And Moses said, I want to know more of your glory. I want to experience more. Think, Moses, what are you thinking? And uh, God says, um, you see more, you'll die. Well, I don't want to die, but I want to see more. So on the mountain, chapter 34, we read these words. Now the Lord, this is the name of God, Yahweh, the Lord descended in cloud. Uh, the idea of God descending, of course, is, is a metaphor, isn't it? Because God is everywhere present. But God um, wanted an impression to be made on Moses, his servant, so he had this sense of God coming near. And this cloud is different than the pillar cloud of chapter 33. Uh, this is an enshrouding cloud, a covering cloud, a cloud um, uh, obscuring one's vision. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this is something that uh, is a symbol uh, of the wonder and the power and the majesty and the holiness of God. And then it says, and he came and stood with him there on the mountain, and then it says he proclaimed the name Yahweh. Um, the word proclaim here is a technical term, and Martin Luther rightly rendered it with the German verb predigen. He preached, that is, God preached the meaning of his name to Moses, and his name is a symbol, it's a cipher for his person. He's going to say who he is, 
what he really uh, means. So the Lord descended, and it says, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, and then we have something that I believe is remarkable, it is unique, and it is emphatic. We have the name of God twice without a comma, without an interruption. That's not true in translations sometimes, but that's what this is, where it says, Lord, Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh. I believe this is the only place in the Bible where the words are together like that. Yesterday, you heard about the word holy being beyond superlative, if I can say that, when it's just, uh, sung by the seraphim in the vision of Isaiah. Here God is going to explain who he is. And in making that case, the name Yahweh is doubled. Um, the accents show that, by the way, those of you in Hebrew classes, there's a munach under the first Yahweh, zakev katon over the second. They join together, Yahweh, Yahweh. And then what does he say? God, who is merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth. Uh, the expression merciful and gracious, rachum v'chanun, these are words that are synonyms. They're saying the same thing, but by having them together, they form what we call a hendiatus, where you cannot imagine how gracious God is as these words come together. Long-suffering, it's a joke in Hebrew, erika payim, long of nose. <laughs> God has a very long nose, did you know that? <laughs> And this is a metaphor as well, of course, and it's a metaphor of anger. That ordinarily, it takes a person a long time for his nose to get red with anger. God's nose is so long, you wonder, will he ever get angry? Well, he does, but it isn't at the drop of a hat. And the, and the big thing is at the end, uh, full of chesed ve'emet, loyal love and truth. This is the definitive self-disclosure of the person of our God in Torah. Again, the name of God, Yahweh, twice uh, joined together. Uh, this is uh, unparalleled, I believe. Sometimes we have Yah, Yahweh, as in Isaiah 12, too. But here, it's Yahweh, Yahweh, Adonai, Adonai, as God is saying, this is who I really am. I don't know if you can imagine God having a page on Facebook. <laughs> and if you asked to friend God and you check to see the about, this is what you'll see. Chesed the Emmet. Oh, you'll see high, and you'll see holy, and you'll see a thousand other things. But what God wants you to know more than anything is his loyal love, the Hebrew word chesed. This is the choice term, H-E-S-E-D, first Hebrew word for some of you. The H is rough. It's not the H in hallelujah. It's the, he it's the H in Hanukkah. Would you say chesed? Chesed, H-E-S-E-D. This is the term that God delights to use of himself. And it's the word I learned from my teacher, Bruce Walkie. There he is, a kid. <laughs> this is 50 years ago in the catalog. I just copied it this morning. And um, this is how I knew him my first uh, year in uh, first year Hebrew. And I remember in class after class, course after course, because I stayed with him a long time, six years, and I learned this concept, loyal love. It's something that he never could get over. In 1982, by the way, this is a more recent picture. This is an 82 picture. But um, his birthday's in two days. By the way, he's going to be 83, I believe. Send him a card. In 1982, we were uh, in Chicago, uh, he and I and 2,000 of our best friends, at the International Council of Biblical Inerrancy. And I saw him uh, that morning, and I asked if we could have lunch together. And he said, Ron, I'd love to have lunch with you. The problem is, you know I'm speaking at, at 1. And I said, well, what if I leave the 11 o'clock uh, hour early, 
and I get a reservation for us, and then I'll meet you at the door, and I'll shuffle you into the little restaurant that's nearest the room that you're going to make the presentation. We'll be the first served. And he says, well, that'll be great. So that's what I did. I met him at the door, and we went into the restaurant where I made a reservation. We were the first table seated, and we were promptly forgotten, absolutely ignored. They had brought, the water was on the table, heavy menus, great big placards, they were there. But um, we were ignored. And he was getting nervous. He's thinking, you know, I, I, I have to have something before one. And I saw a waitress three tables over, and I took this huge menu. And um, I, I thought I'd get her attention. I said, miss, that's what I said, but I didn't. I didn't miss at all. I hit. <laughs> I hit his water goblet, big one, right into his lap. <laughs> oh, talk about dying in public. I couldn't believe it. Um, um, I looked around. Could I blame it on anyone else? No. <laughs> it's in my hand, and he's going, oh! And now we're swarmed with wait, wait staff, and they're bringing napkins and tablecloths, and is there anything we can do for you? Maybe a cup of soup and coffee, and then I'm going to have to go change my suit. And I thought, oh, no. So he did, and I led him into the uh, presentation hall. And he got up to the platform with prepared notes. And I remember he said the introductory words in a formal setting. He opened his folder. He looked down at it. Then he looked out at the audience, and he looked down at it again. And then he said, I can't do this. And he closed the folder, very uncharacteristic, and he walked beside uh, the podium, took his glasses off and started cleaning them with his handkerchief. And then he looked at the person who wrote the uh, essay that he was going to respond to, Dr. Preuss, a wonderful Lutheran scholar. And he said, Dr. Preuss, I just want you to know that everything you've said in your paper on the attributes of God, every single one of them is something that I celebrate, that I am joyfully in agreement with all that you've said. And he took his glasses off again, and you, I think it was the water on his lap, <laughs> and he said, but, um, all right, I'm going to say it. You missed the most important thing. Imagine that. He said, you've said nothing about chesed. And then for 20 minutes or so, he spoke extemporaneously on the significance of this word and how it's the defining word about the character of God. It was something I'll never forget. I thought he would never forget me spilling water on him. The next year, we were in Boston, ETS meeting, and I saw him registering, and I came up after he had finished, and I said, would you care to have dinner tonight? <laughs> he says, Ron, I'd love to. I don't have any other plan. That'd be great. And I said, well, I thought you'd never want to eat with me again. He said, why, why did you say that? I said, well, remember last year in Chicago when I spilled the water in your lap? And he looked at me and says, was that you? <laughs> He couldn't remember the quadrant of a page in BDB where there's a definition of a word, but he can't remember who spilled water on his lap. That's so funny. <laughs> uh, last March, I was in Ephesus. I uh, loved to go uh, leading tours to places in uh, the Mideast and in Euro uh, Europe and in Turkey. And uh, Ephesus is the Disneyland of Bible archaeology, uh, classical archaeology. And you come there and you see so many remarkable things, the theater, this magnificent facade of an ancient library. But the thing you really want to see, in addition to the things you can, is the magnificent temple to the goddess Artemis, also called Diana. After uh, This was, in fact, um, considered one of the wonders of the ancient world. This magnificent building, so beautiful. And you get there, and you talk about being disappointed um, this is like going to Disneyland and Magic Mountain is gone. Uh, it's like coming to Dallas Seminary 
and the classic buildings have been Armageddonized. <laughs> and uh, what do you see? This. You see the footprint. That's all one sees is the footprint of where the temple was and then a lame attempt to give a visual impression of what one of the magnificent columns would have looked like as the uh, architects and engineers have pieced together random drums um, uh, to represent the height and the magnificence uh, of one column and then you think of the full building. Uh, I've seen it before and I still think, ah, oh. but this time I saw something I hadn't seen before. They've always been there, but I'd never seen them. This time, this March, we saw the storks. There's a stork nest on top of the pillar. And in one of the, uh, when I first saw them, one of the pair of storks was hovering over the tower, over the column, over the nest, saw the stork, Chassidah, related to Chesed. And it reminds me of the fact that in Bible times when people had other things to do than with their thumbs on electronic devices, they uh, observed animals in their uh, natural habitat. They watched behavior patterns and they made much of those things. Ideas such as sly as a fox and wise as an owl. Uh, those are all ancient. They're found throughout the ancient world. And when the Hebrew people and their neighbor looked at the stork, the stork pair, uh, they found in that uh, animal something that was so remarkable in terms of its care and protection for its young that they and others have associated with storks and babies and uh, when I was a boy and first asked my mother, where do babies come from, I got the old answer. The stork brought you. <laughs> I asked one of my grandchildren recently about that, and she gave me physiological and anatomical things that <laughs> I didn't know a little child could know. <laughs> but back then, the idea of the stork and protective care was so impressive that the Hebrew word chesed and the Hebrew word for stork, chesedah, have some sort of relationship and the stork becomes a pale but nonetheless significant symbol of the great care and love of God. We saw the storks. God wants to be known by chesed. This is what God said, I am full of grace and truth, chesed ve'emet. This is his own self-disclosure. This is how he desires to be known. When we think of, um, of Jesus, here's an actual digital photograph from the day. <laughs> well, it is. Jim Caviezel's on a, uh, on a, a series right now that I tell Bev, Bev, you've got to come and watch this um, person of interest because Jesus is on this. <laughs> she doesn't agree. Many people ask, what is God like? And the answer of Dr. Rodmacher is classic. What is Jesus like? Well, when you know Jesus, you know the Father. What is God like? Look at Jesus. Do you know what John does in his gospel, in the prologue? He turns that around, as it were. His approach is the opposite. He says, you know what God is like, full of grace and truth, Exodus 34, 5 and 6. Now let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus is just like God. Kars Kyalathia, New Testament, Chesed Ve'emet, Hebrew Bible, Jesus is full of grace and truth as God is full of grace and truth. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. You want to know what Jesus is like? Look at God. Um, and um, this has been the teaching that has supported Dallas Seminary for 90 years. Grace, mercy, goodness, and truth 
may we never forget that God is high and holy, that God is filled with grace, chesed ve'emet, charas kailathia. We say these things, dear Lord, with praise and adoration and with deep joy. In Jesus' name, amen.